Welcome to the Yale 20 lecture series. My name is Maximilian Stahl. I'm one of the second year residents in the internal medicine program at Yale. Um, this lecture is about the antibiotic triangle of truth. Um, and or another name would be the rational selection of antibiotics. Um, this lecture um, originated in collaboration with um, Dr. Dana Dunn, who is one of the premier uh, infectious disease faculty at Yale. Okay, let's get started. So when I was a medical student and I got to the internal med get got to my internal medicine rotation, what happened is patients came up from the emergency room, and in the emergency room. Everybody got Vink and Sosin. And then at the time they got up, my resident was very disappointed in the emergency room and said, like, this emergency room just always gives Vink and Sosin to everybody without selecting any patients. Then Dr. Dunn came and told me, or asked me rather, why did you decide to order that antibiotic? Well, first of all, I didn't order the antibiotic, but now I was here and I had to justify my antibiotic choice. Note here, Dr. Dunn did not say this is a wrong antibiotic choice. She just wanted to know why did you pick those specific antibiotics. Um, and that's kind of the scope for this lecture. We want to teach you how to pick the right antibiotics in the right section and how to present that to your attending, how to make a good case for the antibiotics that you selected. All right. When I think about antibiotic selection in the most general sense, what I think about is a gambling game. Okay? Key is know when you can gamble okay? and when you cannot gamble. That's key. What do I mean by that? Gambling time is you can think about all your rational antibiotic choices, what bacteria you need to cover for, what is the best antibiotic to cover for those bacteria in a certain specific situation? It is a situation when you have a local infection, you have a not toxic appearing patient, and your patient is not immunocompromised. Okay? Then you have time. Then you have time to think, and you can also make risks and pick antibiotics that are more narrow and not as broad as Vink and Sosin. There's another situation when you have a patient with a systemic infection, the patient is toxic appearing or immunocompromised, okay? In this situation, you do not want to gamble, okay? You want to start broad, and you actually want to go with the Wank and Sosin that the emergency room chose, okay? In order to prevent this situation, that game is over and your patient is doing poorly, all right? So really, key of antibiotic selection in the most general sense, is first looking at the situation itself, looking at your patient. Does this patient have a local infection or systemic infection? Is it toxic or non-toxic? Immunocompromised or not immunocompromised? Okay. So the answer, thanks, the answer to the question whether Wang and Sosin is a wrong choice in a lot of patients in the emergency room is not that easy to answer. And most of them it might be because you're in this situation. Okay. Um, patient is doing well, has a local infection, a cellulitis, probably does not need vancomycin and Sosin. But some patients might be in this situation, okay? Your, your patient with HIV, immunocompromised, now with a high fever and a white count. You don't really know where this infection comes from. Then you do not want to gamble. All right. So I talked about to you how to differentiate between those two situations, a toxic patient and non-toxic patient. But I didn't really give you data how to do that, okay? How to technically say a patient is toxic or non-toxic. And you will face the same problem when you try to get a patient to the ICU, okay? So let's say you have a patient on the medicine ward. You think this patient is really toxic appearing, is doing poorly, is probably going into septic shock. And you want to transfer this patient to the medical ICU. So now you have to call the triage um, ICU physician, mostly in attending, sometimes a senior resident, and the senior residents ask you all those questions about the patient. He or she, they want to have normally data, a lot of data, because they have a limited amount of beds, a limited amount of resources, and you have to justify to them why you think your patient needs higher level of care. What I did as a medical student was the following. For a green light, I thought, well, I told the 
attending physician. It's it's just a local f- infection, so I probably don't think it, um, it's ICU care. For yellow light, I was a little bit more worried, and I was telling him my patient is getting septic now. You know, I'm getting worried. Um, I think we should transfer this patient. When the patient was finding septic shock, or at least I thought this patient septic shock, I just cried, help, okay? Just take my patient. Don't argue me in this, okay? Um, this is a way of doing it, but I show you a better way. I show you a way how you can give this um, admitting resident or attending in the ICU a good case why your patient actually needs um, a higher level of care, okay? And you can do this only in five minutes, okay? So you don't need a lot of time for that. You don't need a lot of workup. You just need five minutes, um, and a couple tricks will help you to get all the data that you need. Okay, key to providing clear data is or are the SIRS criteria, okay? Systemic Inflammation Response Syndrome, okay? There are four criteria. Number one is hyperthermia or hypothermia. Temperature greater than 38 degree or less than 36 degrees. Second is tachycardia, heart rate more than 90. Third, tachypnea, respiratory rate more than 20. Okay, or you can look at a blood gas if you have one available, and you can see that this patient has um, alkalosis okay, because he's breathing off all the um, CO2. The last criteria, probably most um, easy to explain, is leukocytosis or extreme leukopenia or 10% of bands, which are immature forms of white blood cells that get um, secreted out from your bone marrow in the case you have a fulminant infection, okay? So those SIRS criteria really help you to make a case, and i show you what I mean by that. First, the green light. You have a local infection. Let's say you have a local cellulitis, okay, on your leg, but there's no evidence of systemic infection, meaning the patient is not febrile, not tachypnic or tachycardic, not tachypnic, does not have a leukocytosis or leukopenia, okay? Then it's just a local infection. And all this patient needs is antibiotics. You can stay on the ward, no reason to go to the ICU. You can go with PO antibiotics, and those antibiotics can be narrow, okay? So this is a time when you can actually gamble, right? You don't need to start somebody with a local cellulitis on Vank and Sosin, if they have no SIRS criteria. What happens if you have something called sepsis? Or what is sepsis? Sepsis, if you have positive SIRS criteria, and by definition, it's two out of four, okay? So either you're tachycardic and febrile, or you're tachypnic and you have a leukocytosis, all of that counts. On top of that, you need to have an infection, okay? And this infection can e- either be suspected or culture-proven. So if you have blood cultures, that's great, but you don't need to have to. If you have an X-ray that shows a consolidation, that's enough to suspect a pneumonia. And this positive SIRS criteria, you have a good case for sepsis. Sepsis meaning your local infection has spread now. Bacteria are in your bloodstream, and you're moving towards a systemic infection. Okay? So those are the patients where you need to be more worried need to consider an ICU admission. That doesn't mean they have to go right away unless they're hypotensive and have, have other things that we're going to talk about in a second. But you should keep a close eye on them. Okay, so those are people where you want to go back to the bedside that you want to monitor closely. They need IV antibiotics. Okay, PO antibiotics are not going to cut it anymore, as well as intravenous fluids in order to prevent them going into septic shock. And antibiotics should be broad, okay? Okay, this is no time to gamble here, all right? Those are the patients that need bank and Sosin, and it's reasonable to give them bank and Sosin right away and then narrow later. All right, red light. Severe sepsis and septic shock. Two other definitions. Remember, sepsis was defined as SIRS criteria plus an infection. Severe sepsis on top of that has evidence of end organ damage. Okay. 
to the extent that more than one organ can be affected. And then you have something called MOTS, multi-organ dysfunction syndrome. All right? You don't want that. And you do not want septic shock. Septic shock is defined as sepsis. So again, SERS criteria plus suspected or proven infection plus hypotension, systolic blood pressure, less than 90, despite appropriate fluid resuscitation. That's what you did here, okay? You gave your patients two liters of IV fluids over the last hour, and they're still hypotensive. Then you're in septic shock, okay? So how do you quantify, how do you prove to, again, to the admitting ICU physician that there is end organ damage? You basically go through every organ, and there are clear parameters to look for that. One of the best ones is just to look at global tissue hyperperfusion, okay? Hyperperfusion to all organs. If there's not enough oxygen coming to your organs, your metabolism changed from aerobic to anaerobic metabolism. And you will see that the lactate, the end product of an anaerobic metabolism is rising, okay? So you have an elevated lactate. You can look at your lungs. You can look at the um, the partial pressure of oxygen and your FiO2, okay, your fraction of inhaled oxygen. And if that is low, that means your lungs are um, damaged and are not getting enough oxygen um, into your bloodstream. We're going to talk about the syndrome called ARDS or acute lung injury more in, in, in your lung lectures, but just know the clear parameters to measure and to prove that you have end organ damage to your lungs. The kidneys, all right? The kidneys are an organ that needs a lot of blood. A lot of blood is going through the kidneys, and they're normally the first ones who go down if you have tissue hyperperfusion. So you can easily look at the urine output, and if it's less than 0.5 cc's per kilogram per hour, or you have a creatinine bump of more than 0.5 milligrams per deciliter up from the baseline, you have AKI and you have a good case that there's not enough going, not enough blood going to your kidneys. Hematologic problems, okay? Your blood is an organ too. It's a liquid organ, but it is an organ. And if you have significant thrombocytopenia or coagulopathy as indicated by a high INR or high PTT, you're getting worried. You're getting worried in particular about something called DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation. And we're going to talk about that a lot in, in, in our heme lectures, but just know for now that those are signs that there's end organ damage to your hematologic system. The liver. Okay, don't forget about the liver. If there's not enough, going, not enough blood going to your liver, you will have a rise in your bilirubin, and more than four is normally here the cutoff. This is when you want to admit somebody to the ICU. Okay, this patient needs IV antibiotics, obviously very broad, needs vascular access, mostly a central line, and often vasopressor support, given that the fluids didn't work. So the attending physician asks you, why does this patient need to go to the ICU? Why should I give this patient my last bed that I have for the night that I save for other admissions that are waiting in the ED? You can make a case. You can say, this patient has... SERS criteria, positive SERS criteria, is febrile, tachycardic, tachypnic, and has a white count, has a suspected infection. I have an x-ray that shows a consolidation. I tried IV antibiotics. I tried intravenous fluids. This patient is still hypotensive, okay, after two hours of fluids. I have evidence of tissue hyperperfusion. He has an elevated lactate, okay. He's not making enough urine. Platelets are low. I'm worried about DIC. And bilirubin is high. I need to admit this patient to the ICU. Believe me, nobody is going to decline this admission. Okay, so now we're done with triaging a patient, telling you how sick a patient is, whether to start a patient broad or narrow. Now we're going to focus about the core of this lecture. It's going to be antibiotic selection and how to make your case to pick certain antibiotics rather than others. All right. It's a dreaded subject. A lot of medical students are afraid of it. It's one of the favorite questions during rounds. Why do you pick certain antibiotics? Why do you leave others out? I tell you, after this lecture, it's going to be as easy as a $1 note for you. Okay. What I want you to take away from it, from this $1 note, 
is this triangle. Okay, for this lecture, we're going to call it the antibiotic triangle of truth. Okay, and if you take nothing away from this lecture, I want you to think about the triangle of truth, and it will help you to uh, to pick the right antibiotics in the right section. So here we have again your triangle of truth. What I think about this triangle is what bacteria do you have to cover for when you have an infection? First one, gram positives. Gram negatives. You're very f familiar with this one. And lastly, often forgotten, last angle, are the two A's, okay? Anaerobes and atypicals. Often forgotten when you pick antibiotics are anaerobes and atypicals. For gram-positive, there's a troublemaker. With troublemaker, I mean it's a type of bacteria that is not covered by most of the antibiotics that normally cover for your gram-positive bacteria, and that's MRSA, okay, MRSA. Gram-negatives has a troublemaker too, actually two, Pseudomonas and ESBL. ESBL stands for Extended Spectrum Beta-Lactamase Inhibitor. Okay, those are bacteria who are resistant against beta-lactamases, including cephalosporins and even solsin. Okay, so I want to keep you in mind that there are gram-positives, there are gram-negatives, there are the two A's, and gram-positive of a troublemaker and gram-negative of troublemakers. All right, and if you think about that, you're going to be golden. What about antibiotics? Gram-positives, great choices are penicillins. All right, they cover against most of the gram positives. They do not cover against MRSA. Okay, they do not cover against MRSA. Antibiotics that also work are penicillins that have a little bit more spectrum than um, your garden variety uh, penicillin. It's unison and augmentin. They're basically the same thing that unison is IV and augmentin is PO. Otherwise, they're pretty much a similar antibiotic. And what they give you, they give you a little bit more of gram-negative and anaerobic coverage, okay? So they're a little bit more broader than just covering for gram-positives. What about gram-negative bacteria? This is where you use cephalosporins, okay? That's where your cepharoxin, your ceftriaxone comes in. For UTI with E. coli, with gram-negative bacteria, ceftriaxone is a great choice. Again, there's a little bit gram-positive coverage as well, in particular in the first and second generation, less so in the third generation of um, cephalosporins. So if you pick a Keflex, you cover for your gram-positives as well as gram-negatives, okay, for a cell lidus, for example. Okay, what about atypicals? Two great choices are macrolides and tetracyclines. Okay. Examples for your macrolides are erythromycin and clarithromycin. Tetracyclines, examples are tetracycline and doxycycline. They also work about spirochetes. And lastly, anaerobes. Okay. Anaerobes, I want, to, I want you to remember three antibiotics. Clindamycin, classically for bacteria above the diaphragm, flagell, classically for bacteria below the diaphragm, as well as bacteria that are kind of more broad spectrum, which are unison, remember unison, or augmentin, but also sosin and meropenem, which we are really your big guns antibiotics. So what did we leave out so far? We left out the troublemakers, right? Don't forget about the troublemakers. All those antibiotics mentioned here, they do not cover against your troublemakers. First one is MRSA. The classic go-to is vancomycin, all right, your most common choice. You can also pick linezolid if you have an allergy against vancomycin, or, and that's something I want you to remember, oral alternatives to vancomycin. In particular, in somebody who has a local cellulitis, you think it could be MRSA, but this patient is not septic appearing, it's not toxic, okay, it's not immunocompromised, and you don't need to give them vancomycin right away. That's a situation where you can pick Clinda, Bactrim, or Doxy. Okay, those are great choices for MRSA if it's a local infection 
without um, sepsis or septic shock. What about your pseudomonas? Three antibiotics to remember. And it kind of goes from narrow to the most broadest antibiotics that you have. A little bit more narrow is ceftas. Okay, it's a cephalosporin here. Um, next one is Sosin, Pepercillin, Tazobactam. And lastly, the big gun is Meropenem. All, right? All of those three cover against Pseudomonas. There's one class of antibiotics that I left out. The fluoroquinolones, Cipro, Moxy, and Levofloxacin. Those are great antibiotics. They're so popular that now we have a lot of resistance against these antibiotics. But why are they so popular? Let's think about it for a second. They cover against the atypicals. They're great for chlamydia, legionella, um, just as macrolides work for them. They work perfectly uh, for those kind of bacteria. They co cover against certain gram positives. That's why they can be used in community-acquired pneumonia against pneumococcus. They cover against gram negatives. Think about your UTI, your E. coli UTI is, is covered by Cipro. And they even cover against Pseudomonas. So they are great, great antibiotics because of their fantastic spectrum. That's why they have been used so much. Certainly because you don't have to think as much, okay? They just cover against a lot of different things. But now we have the problem down the road that, um, that there's a lot of resistance against fluoroquinolones. Okay, so in the ED, if the ED physician picks vancomycin and sulcin, it covers against a lot of different things. Okay, it covers against the gram positive, it covers against your pr troublemaker in the gram positive, your MRSA. If you add sulcin, it covers against gram negatives, it covers against anaerobes, and it covers against pseudomonas. So it's a pretty broad regimen, and that's why the ED loves it. But think about it. There are holes in this regimen, okay? It's not complete. What are the holes? First, atypicals. Vancomycin does not cover against atypicals. Solsin does not cover against atypicals, okay? What about extended spectrum beta-lactamase bacteria? You're going to see results from the microbiology lab that shows that a bacterium is insensitive to ceftriaxone and another cephalosporin, and that it might be show to be sensitive against Sosin, don't be tricked by that. It will not be sensitive against Sosin because Sosin is a beta-lactam as well, okay? So vancomycin and Sosin do not cover against extended spectrum beta-lactamase um, bacteria. And lastly, vancomycin resistant enterococcus, okay, um, is also not covered by this regimen. So those holes are significant and they can make all the difference in your patient. What antibiotics could you pick to stuff those holes? Atypicals, old good macrolides are great. Fluoroquinolones are great. Cipro, Levo, as well as tetracyclines. Okay. Extended spectrum beta-lactamase inhibitors, this is when you need your big guns. Okay. Those, those are the bacteria when you need to take out your carbapenems. Just remember, given that you're now an expert in microbiology, erdapenem, it's no pseudomonas coverage, okay? Then you need to use meropenem instead. VRE, your daptomycin helps and linezolid helps. Again, this is a little bit more expert. ID consult, dapto does not have a lung penetration, okay? So if you're worried about HCAP or MRSA pneumonia, do not use daptomycin if you want to cover for VRE.